Enjoy. There we go. Okay, we are live. So I'm going to drag this out for about 10 to 15 seconds while we wait for people to join us. Um, but I am Rebecca Spees. I am a bookseller at One More Page Books in Arlington, Virginia, and I am so excited um, to have you all join us for April Asher's launch event for Not the Witch You Wed. Um, and she is joined by amazing, amazing folks like Alexis Daria and Mia Sosa. And the conversation is going to be moderated by Trisha Brown. Um, and I will let them introduce themselves if they would like, but I'm so excited to have you all with us. Um, some uh, maintenance before we get started with the event. Um, if any of you watching at home have any questions for April, for any of the authors or Trisha, go ahead and drop them in the comments, uh, either on YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're watching. Um, and we will work those into the Q&A session at the end of their conversation. Um, so that is it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Trisha. And thank you all so much for coming tonight. And congratulations, April. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. I have to do a quick shout out before we get started to one more page. Um, I live in the DC area, as does one more page. And I got to tell you, I have lived here for 15 years, and it has not always been the case that romance bookstores have had a lot to do with rom I'm sorry, that indie bookstores have had a lot to do with romance, but I remember being at one more page events years and years ago. Um, so many thanks, obviously, to that team for always being so supportive of such an extraordinary genre. Uh, and I'm going to let folks do introductions in just a second, but April April, I do want to start with you because you are why we're here. Uh, so I would love to hear, I think, unless folks, you know, stayed at home today and just read Not the Witch You Wed, which <laughs> would be like a good use of time, but I don't know that we know that anyone did that. They probably aren't super familiar with the book. So do you want to talk a little bit about yourself and about how, where this book came from? Where where did this story generate? Um, pretty much. I've always been a huge paranormal fan. Um, and it just so happens that when I fell into publishing, um, paranormal wasn't considered quote unquote in. Um, <laughs> and then fast forward many years until 2019, beginning of 2020 and the pandemic hit. <laughs> and I needed, I needed something that was, was more like I needed a literally a new world. And that's kind of where it came from. I worked a hard shift and I said, all right, what's the furthest from reality I can get? And it pretty much popped in my head, like, you know, true blood, but like not just vampires out in the open, like everybody and, you know, maybe a little less blood and more snark. And I just kind of snowballed. <laughs> it's so there. funny that you say that because I was thinking about true blood because like all of a sudden there's like witches and vampires and werewolves and sex demons and angels. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you got even further actually than the true blood folks did. So... Yeah, Shout I was out. like, you know, I was like, I, initially I was going to do like shifters and witches. I'm like, well, why just, why just shifters and witches? And then I just kind of started throwing everybody. I think that's more fun. It's more yeah. inclusive. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mia, I'm going to go to you next. I know your most recent book is The Worst Best Man, but of course you've written others before that. How, how, do, how would you introduce yourself to these folks? Um... Let's see, I would say I am a pr proud romance writer, writing books that are funny, flirty, a little dirty, um, and dirty in the best ways, um, uh, I think, <laughs> or at least I try. Um, just, I think more recently, I really have gravitated in much the way that April has uh, to sort of um, an escape, um, in my writing. And so these books, the more recent books feel sort of bigger kind of rom-com feel, yeah. 90s rom-coms on the page, kind of everything that I would love to see on film, basically in, um, in my romance novel. I think success, by the way. Totally <laughs> Thank you. There. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of sort of big, robust rom-coms, Alexis, your uh, most recent book is A Lot Like Adios, but before that, in the same series as you had me at Ola, before that, you had a very fun series about dance competitions. I don't know. How would you talk about your uh, writing and your books? Well, like April, I also wanted to write Paranormal, but at the time that I was getting into publishing, uh, they didn't want that. <laughs> So I also pivoted to contemporary romance. So I started with my dance off series and now I have the Primas of Power series. Um, but last year I did release an audible original as did Mia and I was able to make it a paranormal rom-com. So it's short, it's like 
And it is so good. <laughs> but it was so much fun to write. And like April said, to just com explore a completely different world with all new rules. So I really enjoyed that. And I, I do enjoy writing contemporary, but I would love to explore more as well. Can you tell folks the name of your Audible original? Oh, yes. It's called What the Hex. Oh, perfect. Great. <laughs> uh, so yeah, anybody who's uh, looking for, it sounds like a, a shortish audiobook, you're all set. You didn't even know, maybe. I did. <laughs> so I'm excited. Uh, so it's interesting that you all are, at least April and um, Alexis, are kind of interested in that paranormal world. Because I think a lot of times when we talk about world building, people think we're talking about Middle Earth, right? Or like <laughs> Narnia or some kind of very elaborate fantasy world. But one of the things that strikes me about the way that all of you sort of create the settings in your book is that it feels like you are very much creating a world that feels um, kind of both familiar, but very unique. Like the place seems to play, the setting seems to play such a big role, whether it's, you know, the set of a screen flicks romance drama or a, um, a grocery, a Brazilian owned grocery in uh, Wheaton, I want to say, um, Maryland, or whether you're frankly in kind of contemporary New York, but with a lot more witches and demons, right? Like, so can you all talk a little bit about where those settings come from? How do you how do you create the place of of the stories you're telling? Let's go. It's <laughs> okay. Stay, yeah, you start, April. <laughs> we'll start with you. Well, sometimes um, I've always like it, not the witchy way. The first place I thought to have it was New York. You know, uh, my husband's a New Yorker, and it's like one of my favorite cities. Um, so it's just kind of taking um, experiences that you have there and going, you know, you know like going from there. Um, whether it's like a interesting subway station stop or <laughs> it is a trip to a grocery store or um, in Not the Witch You Wed, Violet has some very unfortunate run-in with a hot dog cart and a city bike, you know, um, <laughs> but, and um, something pretty similar happened in her life, you know? So it just kind of, <laughs> it just kind of real life kind of negates to, leads the way to uh, fiction sometimes. <laughs> Except with that, the guaranteed happy ever after. Um, mm -hmm. Alexis, how about you? When you go next? Um, I I actually feel like I'm terrible at writing setting details, <laughs> <laughs> but I do think about world building in terms of what is the scope, like what are the places that they're occupying, um, what do those places you know really look and feel like, and how can I deliver on that feeling in as few. <laughs> words as possible about the setting. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time looking at Pinterest boards for, you know, getting ideas for what their apartments look like or things like that. Or I use details from, you know, my own life, my own memories. Um, the first scene in You Had Me at Ola, they were looking at the refrigerator in her grandmother's kitchen. And that is based on my grandmother's kitchen in the Bronx and her fridge with like, it's covered in magnets. And there was definitely a picture of me from high school on there. <laughs> And probably younger. Mm -hmm. Fair. Mia, how about you? Um, I would say I think about setting really as um, a place to ground the characters. And usually for me in many of my books, there's a large family somewhere involved. And so I try to figure out, well, where the, where is that family going to be? other than in a house, because they're always in a house, right? So I want to try and make it a little bit um, more dynamic and think about kind of what are they doing from day to day and what does that setting say about them? Um, and so for me in The Worst Best Man and in The Wedding Crasher, sort of the centerpiece is the Brazilian grocery store in Wheaton, Maryland. And it is very much something that I can envision in my head, my mother and um, her two sisters um, owned a store in New York City, and I sort of thought about that place and what it looked like. Um, Sans the little um, game player that was in the back that I I used to <laughs> sure um, all kinds of Galaga on and all of that <laughs> myself. But in any case, um, I, yeah, I thought about that and the and the way that they engaged with each other, and then I thought, well, let me take that and put it in a place that doesn't often get a lot of um, page time in romance, which is the Maryland and DC area. And since I'm here, it was nice to actually be able to go 
to places um, in the area and kind of look at them and and get a feel for them and actually describe precisely what I was seeing. So um, so that was helpful. So for me, at least for the last couple of books, it's been my proximity to the area and me being able to rely on things that I know about the area or things that I could easily look up because I do Google as well. Fair. That is such a thoughtful and insightful answer. And yet my takeaway is that this grocery does not actually exist in Maryland. So I cannot go there. Is that? Yes, there is one that, that exists oh. that is very similar to the one that I describe in The Worst Best Man. And wow. I actually, um, I've been there a couple of times. I took my mother there. Um, my mother has recently moved from New York to Maryland and she was like, I'm home. Oh. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. But there oh. is a place that I can um, totally tell you. I cannot okay. remember the name of it right That's now. That's okay. I'll place. bother you later. Um, yeah. And I will totally tell you. So you can visit if you want. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I kept wondering the whole time because so many of the places in your setting are real. I was like, oh, maybe, maybe this one. <laughs> There's a place where we can get all that good food. <laughs> oh, man, that's all I needed. Um, April, I, it's very clear in your book that uh, Violet and Lincoln have a capital H history, right? Yes. There is a past between those folks. Um, me and Alexis, you, you've, you both have written characters that also have that kind of history. Also, I'm wondering how that's different from writing characters who are meeting kind of in the text of a book, right? Because you've got sort of more background that you have to do. Is it less fun not to be able to do the like meet cute live? Like how does how does it feel different? Um, and April, how did you decide that these would be two people who, because they could have just run into each other at a ski lodge, right? But they ran into each other and- Literally. And some. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm a big fan of like the second trope. Um, and a lot of times, like if I had to give a list of like my, some of my favorite books that I've read recently, and I, I'm noticing a theme, it's like mm -hmm. fake dating, second chance and enemies to lovers. <laughs> so um, yeah, I feel like yeah. and that will ring true when all of yep. you read Not the Witch You Read. And um, I like the second chance romance because like you said, there is a capital H history in there and it's usually not a good one. <laughs> so when they do get to you know, have that, you know, that meet cute again, it's usually not so cute, you know, and there's usually sparks, you know, flying and it's fun. And it's just kind of, I love banter. I love, you know, kind of butting heads and that snark that happens when it, when it happens. Yeah. It's like yours had sparks, literally. Yes. Literal <laughs> sparks. <laughs> yes. A yeah. literal collision and literal sparks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, and it's true. Um, I think it's fair to say that oftentimes the history is not great. Uh, Mia, I feel like I would not be inclined to marry the brother of the person who left me at the altar. Yeah. But, I mean, to each their own. Right. Uh, how do you, what, what was the kind of, again, what was kind of the what made it different from writing two folks that just kind of happen upon each other at a wedding naturally? So I remember when I wrote um, what was the first chapter and then I was like, let me just suck this up and call it the prologue. Where they actually do meet and then the bulk of the story happens uh, three years later when they reunite. And I remember in when I was writing that scene that there was um, sort of a glimpse of the tension that would eventually be sort of the crux of their relationship later on. And I just thought it was so delicious. Like there's no other way to explain it other than I was like, I am loving this. I'm loving that they are meeting now that she's about to marry his brother and there's nothing inappropriate about that scene, but it is clear that they are so attuned to each other, even in that moment. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And then three years later, they're going to absolutely not get along. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just the kind of stuff that makes you want to sit in front of the computer and like bang out the chapter. Like it's just, yeah. that's the stuff that really excites me. And I think, that's the fun part when you kind of build that backstory and you're kind of like, okay, well, let's take this fast forward and see what that happened, what that does to their relationship. And I just thought it was so fun when I wrote that. Yeah. The chemistry is definitely there from the beginning, uh, which I think is also true of Gabe and Michelle, Alexis, I would say. Um, and <laughs> it, it was, 
it seems like it's a painful history between the two. But I also think it's fair to say that, uh, at least on some levels, they got over it very quickly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. Um, <laughs> so I was working on that book, and I actually wrote those scenes from their past, like mm -hmm. in first person, 18 years old, like the two of them going through those moments together. And, and then I wrote the book. And my editor was like, okay, but you keep like referring to this moment and like we really need to see it on the page. And I was like, well, but I can't put a flashback in. And she was like, who told you that? <laughs> like, where do you get these rules from? Yeah. yeah. And you know, like when you're starting out, like you just hear all these things like, oh, like people don't like flashbacks, people don't like prologues, you know, stuff like that. And then my editor was like, where, wh who told you that? Mm -hmm. So I worked it in through the narrative, uh, showing it through Michelle's POV. Um, and it really, for me, it really helps to actually write those scenes out because then I can reference them very specifically. Um, and it was just, I just, the two of them were just so much fun to write. They just like, they got along so well, but also like had so much like fire between them. Yeah. So once I got them in the house, I was like, this is not going to last long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. they, they can yeah. make like a little bit of progress and then like, jump into bed, but then they still have all of this other stuff yeah. to deal with because that's the harder stuff for them, right? right? The chemistry right. was fine. Like, and they yeah. were like, let's do this. Yeah. But, you know, working through the rest of it then takes the entire book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was so interesting too, the way you kind of built some of that with the um, intermittent chapters where they're <laughs> they're on AOL, I think, which Basically. is just like such a flashback <laughs> for all of us. Um, and they're writing fan fiction, which is just like a, it was such an interesting way of building another dimension, I think, to that relationship, um, while also kind of helping you understand where they came from and how they got there, you know? Yeah, and that was my solution for having flashbacks in there to show you what they were like when they were kids and just like very quick snapshots. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it's, like I said, it's it's always fun. All of these were very much capital H histories and uh, it, was, it was very, it was very fun. And speaking of kind of histories and, um, part of the history that you know that Violet and, and Link have, April, is secrets. Y'all, all of you write a lot of people who are keeping like a lot of secrets. They're keeping them like from the other main characters. They're keeping them from like their family. Somebody has like, it's not, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say someone has a curse on them and they're not allowed to tell their secret and it's causing a lot of drama. Uh, it does seem though, like all of you are very intentional about the way that you're using those secrets and what people can't tell each other to develop the characters and develop the relationship. And um, I'm interested, if, is that sort of intentional or did it just come to be the case that you decided, okay, you know, Ashton's not going to tell anybody about his family. So we're just going to move that forward. Um, so I don't know, April, we'll start with you again, because it's your party. Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, secrets are always delicious, like, because it me I mean, everybody has secrets. It's just kind of how you know, how in depth do they go? Like, you know, like, like what direction do they go? Mm -hmm. Um, and like with Lincoln, um, the, his secret actually, believe it or not developed. Um, I didn't realize his secret until I wrote the very first entire first draft of the book. And I'm like, all right, something's not quite here. And then I was like, you know what, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to throw in a secret. Um, mm -hmm. and then I went back and I plugged it in everywhere and it just made him more, um, understandable. Um, and then Violet too, I mean, she obviously doesn't know. So I wanted to build up on her frustration with that. And he's, he's trying to make amends for something that he can't tell her, um, until the end, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Mia, I feel like your books have secrets as well. They always have secrets. Yeah. It, <laughs> makes, it makes you wonder what kind of secrets we all have. In I know. Life. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a secretive person. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for me, uh, a secret isn't just I'm not telling the character something. It is, um, when I try to think about it, it is eventually something is going to unfold. And as a result of that, there's going to be an epiphany or there's yeah. going to be some sense that the character is letting go and revealing themselves to the other person. There, like, there has to be something behind the secret. And so I try to think about that, but it's also, it's, you have to be very careful about them, right? Because yeah. 
people can, be, and, I, and I as a reader as well, just sort of, if I am not on board, I'm kind of like, why are you keeping this secret? Is it really <laughs> necessary for you to keep this secret? And so I think for me, when I'm going through the process of kind of like, what is the secret and why is the person keeping it? Sometimes I know that the person who's keeping the secret is the villain. And I'm okay with that. And I'm just kind of like, yep. you're not, you're somehow I have to figure out how to have the reader root for the main characters, despite this character that's withholding this secret that could like make everything better. Right. Um, and then there are other times when the secret that is revealed sort of gets the two people in the relationship closer. And so I just try to think about like, at the end of the day, I want to make sure that people feel like our characters are always good people at their core, despite the fact that they're keeping something from someone, right? And so that's the, like, you have to be careful about that. But I just, I feel like secrets just, there's just so much that you can work with when somebody is withholding something. And, you know, as a writer, I'm thinking, well, when do I reveal this? And mm -hmm. What does the reader know and when should the reader know it and who, you know, else besides the main characters know it? I just think like all of that, when you sort of map it out on the page, it can be very interesting. So I found it always fun. I'm like, let's get a secret in here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Alexis, I'm curious about your take on that, because I, I, you know, the one that comes to mind from your books is the secret between Ashton and Jasmine. Right. And it ends up, you know, Mia pointed out, you have to be careful because that's a, a breaking of trust that really could kind of turn off a reader. But I think you really walked that line between making it clear why he would do that. I don't know. How did that come about? I, I knew that he was going to be a single dad. Mm -hmm. um, but I, the reasoning behind it kind of developed as I went. I always think about these stories as we... Um, we reveal ourselves in layers, right? Like you wouldn't tell someone you meet at the grocery store for the first time, like certain things, right. but you might tell your, you know, great friend that you've known for 10 years and you have that level of trust and vulnerability with them. And I think always I'm writing about people who are deepening their trust in each other yeah. over the course of the book. With Ashton in particular, it was, you know, that he had gone through something. And I think yeah. if you are going to have a character with a secret, you can pull it off if their motivation is really clear on right. the page and believable. Yeah. Like you have to be able to go, okay, I wish they would just come clean, but I get why based on who they are and what's happened to them, why they would not do that. So right. for Ashton, it really was making sure that his backstory and his motivation were very clear. I also didn't want his son to be a secret from the reader for very long. So that's revealed very quickly. Yeah. But the why behind that and why he's keeping him hidden and protected, really, that mm -hmm. comes through much later as he gets to know uh, Jasmine. Mm -hmm. But even so, like he, you know, spoiler alert, he doesn't tell her himself and she's very put off by it. And they, yeah. you know, her cousins point out to her later, like, you just met him. Like mm -hmm. you trust people very easily, but that's, yeah. you know, not always the case for everyone. And maybe you shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to play with those, those different things. And in that way, they're both kind of opposites. So it was some inner, you know, conflict and tension between them where she just like wanted everything and wanted mm -hmm. to know everything immediately. And he was like, that's not who I am. And I yeah. have like very good reasons for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then it's that growing, um, that growing trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, one of the things that strikes me as well about the way that all of you craft your stories and tell your stories is how much trust you <clears> seem <throat> to have in your readers, right? Like you trust them to follow you to some place that might be a little bit unfamiliar to them. And I think that can look a lot of different ways, right? Like April, you crafted this whole, you know, paranormal New York City, but never got stuck in that exposition quagmire of like, well, this is a council and these are the five people that sit on it. And this person's an angel and this is what that means. And like, it just, it kind of comes through in the way that you're telling your story. And I think, you know, um, Alexis and Mia, you both have passages that are in Spanish or in Portuguese that may be languages that the reader is not familiar with, or even um, kind of writing a romance within the romance. And you had me at Ola, Alexis, I think is, it, it all just strikes me as, 
I think rightfully trusting that your readers will go with you, even if you aren't kind of spoon feeding or hand holding that whole time. And so I'm curious, um, we'll, we'll let April go second this time. Uh, I'll go over a little break, Mia. I'll start with you. Is that intentional or is that is that just kind of the way you feel about the, the readers that you have? Um, I mean, whether uh, it's a, it, that's a really good question and I'm sort of sitting here like, is it intentional? But I, I trust my readers because I feel like I am, I have some sense of kind of uh, the readership that I'm aspiring to grow. Um, and they are, and I think that I already have to some extent. Um, and I, get the sense that what folks are looking for is they're looking for like a little bit of reality within their escape. And so that's what I'm, you know, trying to give them is kind of, if you were to, you know, walk the streets in any city, what does that look like? And how does that feel? And you're not going to understand everything, but you're, you get a sense of the setting and the place and the people and, that's kind of what I'm trying to do on the page. And readers are just really astute and, you know, so into, I think, the worlds that you create when it's clear that you love them. Um, and I think that's the thing. Like, I think when you when it's clear that you have care for the characters and you care about the world that you're creating, um, readers will go with you anywhere. And like, and I'm, you know, even in, the latest book um, that's not out yet, The Wedding Crasher, like I'm taking folks places perhaps they <laughs> have never been and never expected to go, but I'm trusting that they'll um, sort of be so immersed in the world that they'll get it. Yeah. And April, how about you? How did you get, how did you keep yourself from just doing the whole kind of like, here's one, ch do you, I don't know if any of you read the Babysitter's Club, but there was always the second chapter of the Babysitter's Club. They would just lay out, it was like the same basically in every book. They would just lay out the entire backstory of everyone. I mean, it must be, honestly, probably as a writer, that would be easier, but for readers, it's less interesting. So how do you keep yourself from doing that? Um, pretty much it's what I like and like enjoy reading, you know, like if, if I think that something is very like too cut and dry, I'll start flipping, you know, forward a little bit. Um, and then just writing what you love personally, and then just hoping that, if, you know, if you love it, somebody else is going to love it. Yeah. Um, and then just have it just kind of like filter down. And that's pretty much it. I mean, you don't know how people will receive it until you do it. Um, and that's why they always say, write what you know, write what you love, and then that will kind of shine through um, into your readers. Yeah. Alexis, how about you? How did you decide that people would go with you if you put, you know, different pieces of a romance drama just in the middle of your romance novel? Uh, well, so I also read a lot of The Babysitter's Club and I thought that was just how you write books. That the <laughs> yeah. was just like, what everybody likes to wear and what their handwriting I mean, is like. Yes. <laughs> you know, really important details. Who likes junk food? Who's a health nut? Right, yeah. Right. Food. <laughs> so um, I was in for a, a, a rude awakening. Yeah. <laughs> but I, as a reader, you know, I think going to what April said, like, what do, what do I like, right? I like it when a book kind of like dribbles in like clues for you about some sort of puzzle for you to solve. Um, not necessarily that it has to be like a mystery or whatever, but where there's, there's something where you're like, was that that thing? And then you see it again and you're like, oh, wait, I think that's like that. And then you're looking for it. So, and you had me in Ola, I had these interstitials where Jasmine and Ashton are on a telenovela together. And I really th thought a lot about how do I show them filming? Because I thought I would write it just like my dance off series where it's like mm -hmm. them in the moment, but it's really different when they're dancing straight through for you know a minute and a half versus doing multiple takes from different angles and having stand-ins and things like that. And I was like, oh, this is gonna get boring. Like if they're constantly being told cut or doing things over and over. And I said, well, how do I do it? I'm just gonna show it. And I'm gonna show it through the lens of the characters that they're playing, but still inside their head. So you are still always in Jasmine and Ashton's POV throughout the book, 
but they're in character. And there are just tiny breaks in the fourth wall in yeah. every one of those scenes. And those are the clues that I dropped in. So it'll be something like where Jasmine will think about like how hot he is, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not a line from the show that she's on. It's just her like touching him and she's like, oh my God, his chest. Or, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, there's a scene, yeah. it's one of my favorite, probably my favorite scene in the book where he is having an allergy attack mm -hmm. while filming because they've brought in like kittens and puppies and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then he has to hold a snake, like a giant <sighs> python and he like, <laughs> sneezes and he just like freaks out. Mm -hmm. So you are getting what they're really thinking and feeling in those moments in addition to them trying to channel the characters as well. So that was, um, that was how I approached that. Um, and for me, it was a lot of fun. I don't know that everyone gets it, mm -hmm. but. But it's an I, awfully fun was, dimension, right? Like it's a different kind of way to tell the yeah. story. Yeah. And it's I, like a screenplay nice come to life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a screenplay come to life. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. I think it was necessary to show those parts because otherwise, like, I can't just show them filming something and not show what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And you get a secondary romance. Through. Yeah. And I will tell you, if you had told me that you were going to put a scene with an intimacy coordinator in your book, I would have been like, oh, okay, this is <laughs> that it was fascinating. Like, it was so interesting to have, you know, kind of what that is like and what that background is like. Um, it's another part, I think, of kind of that world building, right? Of mm -hmm. this is part of what, what these people are doing. This is what it's like to be filming a romance. Um, so anyway, I see that we are getting some questions and please keep sending them. I'm going to ask another one or two and then we'll, we'll shift over to hear what we are hearing from folks. Um, another theme that is, despite how different all of your books are, another theme that is very present through all of them is family and the importance of family. But I think the thing that really strikes me is that it's intergenerational, right? It's like, it's the primus, right? It's not just, um, you know, a sibling or a, it's, it's family that doesn't necessarily look like your leave it to beaver nuclear family or whatever. Um, but it's, there's so much love. And as a reader, I felt all of that. I felt all of the love, but I also felt all of the drama and like kind of the crises. And I wonder what it's like for all of you to be writing that, right? Is it, um, cause I found it very kind of impactful and, and it really hit me. So I can't imagine what it was like to put that on page. So what is that like to be putting those, those, familial stories together. I always love, I think every book I've written, it, there's always a big family, mm -hmm. um, whether it's like found family or the family that you're born with. Like there's always, um, because nobody in the family is the same. Everybody is so different, you know, and there's squabbles and there's makeups and there's unconditional love. And um, even if you are so different, you want, you want different things. Um, like, and not the what you add, like Edie, you know, she's like the grandma. She's like supposed to be this, you know, the biggest, baddest witch of them all, you know, and she's like calls her granddaughter Bay, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you yep. know, and she's definitely a lot spicier in book two. So, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. um, but I like showing those um, intergenerational um, relationships. Um, and then I think the relationships, especially between like the women in our books, like two, like, you know, sisters and best friends and cousins and things like that. And I think showing that those relationships can be really close and not be com like combative or like confrontational. That's really important, I think. And I think that's one of the reasons why I, I always put strong female relationships in whichever book that I'm writing at the time. I think it's really important. Yeah. Uh, Mia, uh, Alexis, how about either of you guys? Um, I I don't know about anybody else, but I certainly know that um, in my romantic relationships, my family has always been involved in some way. <laughs> <laughs> and I just feel like that's the nature of um, you know, a, a romantic relationship is that if um, the if you have family and that is found family, um, the family that you're born with, I feel like they're, they're involved in some way. They're, you know, they're part of yeah. who you are. Um, they're part of your character. They're part of your history. They know you better than anybody else. Um, and I think there's so much that you can draw <laughs> from, but it also, it just feels for me, very comforting to write these stories where people are falling in love and they're surrounded by people who love them. 
and yeah. want the best for them. And they may not always take their advice. And there may be things that they have to wrestle with during the course of their character arc. But at the end of the day, it's just, I don't know, it just feels like a soft place to land when you know that your characters have people who have their backs and, you know, want them to be okay and want them to, to, to find love. Um, and so to me, it just kind of feels like it's the right mix of things in the romances that I write. Yeah. It does feel like there's always somebody who's going to catch them like during that dark moment, even right. <laughs> um, Alexis, what, how about you? I think, <laughs> you know, we're writing about characters getting over things as well as falling in love, right? They've got to work through whatever blocks they have toward opening themselves up to even the possibility of this other person. And I think often those things that we're working on come from <laughs> our families of origin. Yeah. So it's, I mean, like you said, there's a, a great source of conflict and drama there. Um, but like Mia said, with found families and April said, with just those like different kinds of relationships, um, you know, I think with the primas, what I tried to show with them is that there is this like, there's this relationship where they're not sisters, but they're not just best friends either, right? It's like mm -hmm. this kind of blend of being family and being friends. But at the same time, they do still keep secrets from each other. Mm -hmm. And it's, I like to play with that idea of like, what are the things that you don't even tell the people you tell everything? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of room for conflict there as well, because none of these characters operate in a vacuum, right? Yeah. They're all like in the world, whether they've got friends or coworkers, they're the people that they interact with on a regular basis. And those people are going to have an effect on them as well. And yeah, they come in at the end when that person is like at their lowest and they're like, Hey, wake up, go after, go yeah. after what you want. Yeah. Um, and then they're finally at that place where they can hear it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the journey that we're all showing. Yeah. I feel like there's also such a buffer of like, you know, that the happy ending is coming between the main characters, but having that family, there makes you feel like it would be okay even if there wasn't right like you know it's coming and you're happy about that but you know this person is going to be okay yeah. um and that's the thing that you know as someone who can't who gets very anxious about the dark moment i always have really appreciated <laughs> that um so i will pause my questions for now because we are getting some from the audience and they are far more interesting than i am so uh, we uh heard from helen who asked do each of you have a favorite wish from tv or movies or books Oh man. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm I'm gonna say I'm I'm the biggest Buffy nerd on the face of the planet. Um, so I'm gonna say Willow is probably one of my favorite. Um, just because she starts off so sweet, you know, and then you then you go back down to like the dark Willow. Like I just love it. I think she's probably one of my favorite. I Mine, I was looking to see if I had a figure of her here because I have a few. <laughs> <laughs> Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, oh, um, yes. my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. I met her when I was 16 years old. Oh, wow. And told her that that was my favorite movie when I was six. And she was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> because my mother would rent it for me from the library. Sure. I mean, <laughs> libraries, you know, doing the Lord's work out there. <laughs> I have, where did you meet her? Where was that? San Diego Comic Con. Okay. That is awesome. <laughs> Mia, how about you? Anything jump to mind? I would say, I, I mean, immediately it came to me that it was the, my, the trio of witches in Hocus Pocus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beth Midler as the, um, the main witch. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think of their names, but I couldn't. Um, but we do watch. Yeah, I could um, tell you all of them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You've got all those t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, we watch... Uh, Every Halloween, pretty much. They're doing another one. I think like this it comes out this October year. 31st. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not that anyone's keeping track, but no, <laughs> not. Not in the least. You gotta do a watch party, April. <laughs> you know, I, I think we might do what we did a watch of the first one the other the other two nights over the weekend and it turned out good. So I think we may do one for the second one. Ah, oh, perfect. Mark your calendars, everyone. Yeah, everyone, you're all invited. It's gonna be great. 
Um, all right, we've got Adrian Asher. I don't know if there's any relation. April, I am halfway through Not the Witch You Wed. When is the next book in the series coming out? So I, this is actually wonderful because I would like to know when it's coming out. I would like to know who our main characters are. <laughs> and then Mia and Alexis, I'm gonna um, ask both of you to talk about your next book as well. But April, you've got so, me in suspense. All right, so uh, we don't have a firm pub date yet, but it's either gonna be February or March of 23. Mm -hmm. um, and you get a, a glimpse of who it's going to be in the uh, epilogue of Not the Witch You Wed. So it's going to be Rose. Oh. Um, and to the, uh, the half demon veterinarian, Damien. <laughs> and then book three is Olive and Bax. Which Interesting. I mm -hmm. is, there, is there not a fourth book? There's not another yet. couple of people that not I had. But I own. have, yes. I, every With every book I write, I always keep in mind I always plan for more mm -hmm. you know what I mean so like um I already have ideas for like three more after the sisters so I'm just saying we'll like see. if there happens to be like a shifter and a succubus who I would love you yeah. oh I love but Harper so you. much I want to be Harper sometimes <laughs> I swear yeah I'm not gonna tell you how to live your life but <laughs> I do have or write your book. yeah exactly or write your book <laughs> I mean either way um <laughs> me you've got a book coming out soon i do i do so the next book is um the wedding crasher which is um the book basically the follow-up to the worst best man um and that one starts uh dean um who is the best friend of max in the first book and solange um lena's cousin so and i do believe it's a true standalone so far people have responded and said they felt like they didn't have to read the first book but encourage people to read the first if they wanted to um and so i'm really excited about that and that comes out april 5th uh alexis it is so good before you answer i feel like there might be a hat situation that we're missing out on oh point. yes all right are we doing it all right let's do it let's do go I know how to put this on it, i mean ooh. This is the best looking video call I've ever been a part of, frankly. It already was, and now it's even more true. I don't know. I have to, now here, I'm gonna I have to take a picture of this. <laughs> I, I mean, you got, yeah, those, those are some strong poses. Some strong poses. <laughs> okay, what were we saying? My next book. Um, yes. What, who, when, when we come, what's, tell us, just tell us all the things. So this is Ava's book in the Primas of Power series. It's book three. It's the last book in the series. And it's um, probably coming out next year because yeah. I'm still writing it. <laughs> so we're looking at May of 23. And um, I'm not really giving details because every okay. time I say something about the book, I change it. <laughs> but, <laughs> I feel like um, that's, it's, we know it's number three. And know we know that Ava. It's Ava. It's Ava's turn. divorced. Mm -hmm. um, so this is her really getting like her fairy tale romance. I like it. Which she so deserves. I love that. Um, all right. Well, we're excited for all of them. Uh, we have a question from the great and good uh, Tiff Marcello asking, um, who is a, a lovely, wonderful author in her own right. When you write your secondary characters, are you already planning their books in your head? So we kind of got into that a little bit. And what, what yeah. more would you all say about that? Oh, I, de I definitely do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like I said, I already, I already kind of set up for a Harper and an Adrian that I can't wait to like get into. And oh yeah, I definitely, I definitely do with each time, each time I bring a new character on. Um, and then you, you'll see another character in the second book. Um, he's actually there in the first but you get introduced to him. Um, but he would make a good book six. So I'm always planning ahead. I like it. So yeah. I plan ahead, but it doesn't always pan out the way that I expect. <laughs> <laughs> so I often Thanks. have um, characters in follow-up books that were never intended to be um, the main characters of their own books. And mm -hmm. for some reason during the writing process, like they jump out at me and then I'm like, all right, this person needs a story and I'm going to write this story. But it's kind of often at the very end of the process. And I'm like, okay, now I have to figure out what, <laughs> what I can weave in. Um, but it's a fun process when a secondary character kind of jumps out at you yeah. and you feel like, 
this person is like stealing the scenes. And so when they steal the scenes, I'm like, well, that obviously means they need to have their own story. So that's what I do. I end up. Yeah. Talking. <laughs> Alexa, I, mean, I, I knew that the Padimas of Power were going to be about the three Padimas. Like that yeah. was always set up. Um, but I, I'm always tempted to include hints for the next book, mm -hmm. but I don't because I know that I'm probably going to change something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I did write the characters like knowing kind of what their tropes were going to be. Mm -hmm. Like I knew that Michelle was going to reconnect with somebody from her past and that it was going to be a former friends to lovers. Yeah. Um, it was originally going to be like a high school reunion mm -hmm. storyline, um, which I'm, glad I didn't do. <laughs> uh, and then with Ava, it was going to be a younger man. And then that just like didn't pan out. So I mean, not for now, who knows, right? Not, like, well, you got some space. You got some time. Right. Um, you know, and it was going to be like set in the theater or something. So, you know, you just you don't always know. Um, when I was writing the dance off series, though, I really thought at the beginning that that was just going to be a standalone book. And then I had this mm -hmm. huge cast of characters. And I was like, yeah. what was I thinking? Of course, yeah. I have yeah. ideas for all of these people. Yeah. And it wasn't until the end of the first book that I wrote the main character's roommate coming in. And I didn't even know what was going to happen in this scene. It was just that she needed to come in and like see her. But then she was like, oh, were you with him again? And she's like, oh, babe, you said you weren't going to do that anymore. And she's like, I oh, know, I know. But like, yeah. you know, I tripped and fell on his, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. And then I was like, I, I didn't even that. see this romance coming. Yeah. And then that is this, too. Does that, does the way that y'all think, about, this is me adding on a little bit. Does the way that y'all think about that impact at all the way that you write your books as sort of standalone? Because I will say, I think everything that I've read by each of you can be stood alone. Um, and obviously, April, you're only the first in your in your series so far. So, um, does it change the way that you think about that? Do you want an interconnectedness, or is it important to you that everyone kind of really can be pulled out of the shelf? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that if someone just reads one book, they have a satisfying experience reading that one book. But if they read all of them, they feel like they've gotten a more complete experience. Right. Nice. Either is fine with me. Obviously, I would prefer that everyone read all of the books. Yes. <laughs> all of our books. Perfect answer. Fair enough. Um, all right. From Kristen, uh, April, which Maxwell sister do you identify with the most? You know, I was trying to think of that because somebody had asked me that before. I think um, I'm probably, I would, like I said, I would like to be Harper, who's not a Maxwell <laughs> sister, but mm -hmm. I think I'm probably more like Olive, although I do have Violet's like snark. If, and or you would if my husband would probably would call it stubbornness and attitude, but um, I have I'm like Violet in that way. But I think I'm definitely um, have a lot of all of qualities too. Can you talk a little bit about the three of them or the four of them, either way, <laughs> uh, for the folks who are who are just new into the book, trying to figure out like where they might fit? So Violet is the magicless witch. You know, she's the oldest of the triplet. She's supposed to be by supernatural expectations, the most powerful of her sisters. And she does not have a lick of magic at all. So she, but she's happy living her norm existence, being a bartender and, you know, just doing her thing. Um, she is very snarky and she does, uh, she has a little bit of an attitude. Um, and Rose is the sister that um she steps up into that prima role and becomes that figurehead that she, she didn't really want the position. She kind of stepped into it, added duty to her family. Um, and that really definitely plays into book two a lot. Um, and poor Olive, she's always been like the studious one, her nose buried in a book, which is probably why I identify with her so well. <laughs> Um, and I'm excited to write her book too, because she is the one that they rely on to be like the level headed one at yeah. like all times. And I th I'm, I'm planning for her book to, she's not going to be so level headed anymore. So I'm kind of excited. <laughs> I mean, now I'm excited too. You know who they reminded me of a little bit? The sisters in Encanto. Encanto? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There is major Encanto themes in, yes. uh, not, if you wish it was like a little bit dirtier. Uh, I feel like they were, everybody's like a little older. I think, yeah, this is, this is the book for you. Encanto uh, Adult Edition. Yes, yes. Uh, and with more shifters, I think. Yeah, right exactly. Now. 
Um, you know, we've talked kind of a little bit about, um, you know, timelines and books and how everything's going. I think anybody who is a reader or lives in the book world knows that the, like the last couple of years have just been really rough, I think, for everybody in a lot of ways. Um, I know it has impacted me as a reader and we did, um, uh, I co-host a podcast called When in Romance and we did a survey about six months ago just to hear from people about how the last couple of years and the stress of the pandemic and the stress of everything else that has come with it has impacted folks um, one of the things that we did find was that a lot, a lot of people have found romance uh, in this time because kind of they're looking for that happy ever after, right? They, they, they're looking for that, that guarantee that the, um, that they will come away with an emotionally satisfying ending. I'm curious though whether the last couple of years have impacted any of the three of you as a writer or as just a reader. Um, are you reading differently? Are you thinking differently about books? Yeah, I definitely. Um... I fell back into that paranormal where I found that I grew up with that I found that comfort um, just because romantic suspense was even, even though it was like, you know, car chases and explosions and things like that, it was just too, too closely based in reality at the time. Um, and I needed something that was not based in reality. And um, I think that was a huge, and I think everybody was feeling like that in 2020. And I think that's really what fueled that, the paranormal resurgence, you know, that, yeah. um, and I knew that if I needed that escape, you know, of, from realism, I know a lot of people did. And I did in my reading, I did in my writing. Um, not the witch you wed today is like the fastest book I have ever written. Like when I approached my agent with the idea and she's, and I told her, I said, look, I need this. <laughs> and, she's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> and she's like, go ahead, see what happens. And I think I wrote the first 100 pages in like less than a week. Um, and prior, prior to that, because of COVID and nursing and family stress and everything, I was struggling. Like I was writing maybe a page like every couple of days. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the yeah. fact that I was able to bust out 100 um, in less than a week and then like give it to her. And she's like, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. Also just um, shout out. Cause we all have the same agent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it spoke volumes. Like that's, I think people just needed to have that break and that. So, yeah. yeah. I, I listened to a lot of audiobooks mm -hmm. in 2020. Like, you know, I basically just do puzzles and listen to audiobooks because I hit a point where I couldn't watch TV. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then last year, I hardly read anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or I started a lot of books and I just couldn't finish them. Just yes. not because of the books, just was, me. Like my concentration mm -hmm. yeah. was just shot. Yeah. So I have not been writing. I've also like been writing in bursts. Mm -hmm. Like I will spend a long time plotting the book and gearing up to write it and then just kind of like mm -hmm. put it all out in like a fiery blaze of glory and like yeah. two weeks, yeah. write the whole book yeah. is where I am right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, I think it's, it's been hard to write. And I, I think like April said, like finding those things that like you're really excited about, like when I wrote what the Hex, I wrote it in a week also, like yeah. it just like flowed out of me. It was so much fun. And that's um, when you know it was meant to be, you know yeah. what I mean? Like that's what you needed. Yeah. And I, I think for all of us, just as creatives, like, you know, really going back to like what it is that we love, like as readers, as people, as writers, um, and then focusing on that part of it makes it a little easier. Yeah. I used to read a lot more uh, nonfiction. <laughs> Like so many more. Yeah. Like, I think the thing that has happened in the past couple of years is I've really, really just, I, I dove into romance and was like, you know what? It's perfectly fine that I'm not reading anything else. Whereas I think before I was more likely to, you know, have a couple of different types of books um, near me or on my bookshelf. And now I'm kind of like, no, this is, this <laughs> is where I need to be. This is what feels good. And I think it's, it, I gave myself um, the freedom to just say it is perfectly fine that this is what I want to read and that this is what is getting me through this like really tumultuous time. And it, and it really did. Um, and romance did. And unlike anything that I could have ever read, like I know that romance books have made the past couple of years um, bearable. 
um, just because it's been so unsettling. And there is just something about reading a romance novel and knowing particularly that there are so many authors out there who yeah. know how to give you that comfort and know how to stick the landing and give you that happily ever after that makes you go, oh, this is why I read romance. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been amazing, at least to know that I have that as an escape. Yeah. I think one of the things that we heard in um, the survey that we did was that a lot of folks started doing kind of what you all are saying. They gave themselves permission to either stop reading a book if they were not into it. They gave themselves permission to only read or to reread. There was a lot of rereading, right? Like mm -hmm. people- Those comfort reads. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. People yeah. kind of were just giving themselves permission to be whatever kind of reader they wanted. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of the folks too that came to romance because they were looking for the happy ending, if they were not so familiar with the genre, they were delighted to find actually that these are really good books written by very mm -hmm. talented people. Like they, you know, there's, there can be such bias against it. And so it's, it's not a thing that people shouldn't know, but unfortunately some don't. And so I think that has made, once people understood how much talent there is authors like the three of you and how, you know, what kind of storytelling that is, they're, they're never going back, right? Like even when all of this is, is said and done. So um, that is, yeah. So anyway, it's good good to hear everybody's kind of been reading. I think we're getting close on time. I will ask you one more question, just kind of for fun. Um, if you've been reading in the last year, <laughs> two years, three years, whatever, is there a book uh, that you've been reading or an author that you've read um, that you feel like is under the radar that you would like for folks who are tuned in tonight to be able to, to maybe pick up and, and read? Gosh, well, like Alessa said, I haven't read too many um, books over the last year, but I did read, I wouldn't, she's definitely not under the radar, but um, I read um, the first Betwixt book of Dorinda Jones. Um, and I absolutely fell in love with her heroine because she is a 40 some year old heroine who she has been around the block a few times and she knows things. And there is a mysterious stranger living in her basement who wears a leather kilt. And he's like, <laughs> and I was like, I, I mean, I've known, I've known Dorinda of, you know, for a while now, but I, I don't know how it took me so long to find her Betwixt series. Like, I guess, I think there's like four and she's getting ready to release number five. But like, mm -hmm. I was like, when I saw it was like an older heroine and, there was a kilt involved. I was like, all right, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I'm asking this question partly selfishly. I'm like taking notes. Here, so. <laughs> How about anybody else? Anything? That's um, one of the ones actually that um, I read recently is um, A Delicious Dilemma by Sarah Taino. And I feel like um, everyone needs to read that book. I just feel, I just, it, I don't know how to explain it, but it's completely immersive. Like I just felt, I totally fell into this world. Um, there's a, um, a Puerto Rican restaurant owner. She owns the restaurant with her dad and there is a developer and talk about secrets. This is Harlequin special edition. So yes. he's keeping a secret about the fact that he is the developer that is trying to develop the area in which he obviously doesn't want to have developed. And it's just, it's so juicy, but it's also like, I just feel like her writing is, um, uh, it has a, a rhythm to it that is very comforting and I wish everyone would read it. It's very good. I'm, I'm trying to think of one, but I mean, there's, there's a few, I'm trying to pick one. Um, <laughs> I would say Hana Khan carries on oh, by yeah. Uzma Jalaluddin is, you know, I really loved Aisha at last, but this one is just it's so funny and it's um, kind of uh, one of those stories where like they know each other in one in one area of their lives, but then don't know that they know each other in another area. And it's it's set in Toronto and there's kind of like dueling restaurants. Um, and it's it's just like it's so fun um, and such a good romance. Um, and the audiobook was great. Like. It just it was just like a really good one. I just like love her books. <laughs> Hooray. Well, thank you all for uh, all of the books that you are writing and have written for everybody to be able to get through a tough time and for recommending a few others. Um, this was a blast. Thank you so much for for uh, chatting with us. Rebecca, I think I think we might be 
knock it on eight o'clock. Excellent. <laughs> I pop right on. Welcome back. back. <laughs> um, but yes, I am. This was such a wonderful conversation to be able to sort of eavesdrop on. <laughs> um, and thank you all so much again, Trisha. That was a great conversation. Mia and Alexis, thank you for joining us. And April, a huge congratulations on the release of Not the Witch in the Red. Um, I linked all of the books that they just recommended in the comments. Um, so check those out um, in the comments. And I have also dropped the link for April's signed and personalized copies of Not the Witch You Wed. Um, if you haven't gotten your copy or you need to buy 12 more for all of your friends and family, <laughs> you can do that. Um, but yeah, that does it for us tonight. Thank you so much. Um, the listeners at home and watchers at home for joining us. Um, and I think that's all of my housekeeping. Um, a huge congratulations again and have a wonderful rest of your evening, everyone. Thanks for coming, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Happy release day, April. Thank hey. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.